J. Dabby Research, Clinical Research and Review. Uh, Dr. Sujay Majumdar, about gut. Uh, thank you, sir, for such kind words. And I'd really like to thank Banshi for inviting me here. But I'm a bit curious because I thought this was a sort of an in thing. Banshi was very much concerned about this particular condition, so he has got two speakers speaking on the same topic. One is me, and one is one of my colleagues who is going to speak on the same topic in the next talk. So I was just wondering, does Banshi have a plan to do some sort of a research study on this particular element of the Now this will be our next research meet. That's what my innocent question was. Anyway, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about the famous French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau said it was, I mean, he was one of those uh, very famous, I should say, intellectual advisors before the French Revolution. And one of his very famous statements was, man was born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And same thing is, happens with the human gut also. A newborn baby is born free, but at each and every step of his life, he gets infected with the microorganism. And basically, this entry of microorganisms in a, in a newborn baby, it can act through the vaginal mucosa, it can act as a contamination from the rectum, as well as the skin, from breastfeeding, and from the introduction of solid food. So there are multiple ways by which the gut can get colonized by microorganisms. And un the funniest thing is that after you attain the puberty, most of the time, this gut microorganisms, they remain unaltered until you reach a very old age. Now, what is also important to bear in mind the fact that adult humans have got more than 10 times the number of bacterial cells than the total number of cells constituted in the human body. And majority of microbacteria are bacteria, but there are some viruses and fungi are also present. So basically they're divided into four headings. One is the firmicutes, the other one is the bacteroidetes, one is the actinobacteria, and the other one is the proteobacteria. And if you look at this particular business slide, this also gives the subtypes. I'm sorry, I'm not authority on that, so I'll not try to show my ignorance by getting into each and every one. But suffice it to say, these are two important ones. But remember these two names, the firmicutes and the bacteroidetes, because these are the ones which play actually a role of this gut influence on diabetes and metabolism. And if you look at the number of bacteria in the different parts of the body, we can see here the highest number of bacteria are present at the two ends of our gut, at the mouth as well as the large intestine. These are the ones which contain the highest concentration of bacteria. Now, what are the factors which are affecting the gut microbiota in adult life? So basically, it can be influenced by diet, it can be influenced by the diseases, it can be influenced by medicine, and also by the food. In fact, we're going to talk about this. This itself is going to be a 30 minutes presentation, so I'm just going to jump to it. A few important facts which you have to remember is that prolonged use of antibiotics can lead to a large reduction in the amount of pressure throughout the gut which we call it home. But this, what is important to bear in mind is the fact that some of these alterations can persist for a long time. For example, if you're treating someone with clindamycin, this effect of this alteration of the gut flora can last up to a period of four years. And there have been studies which have shown that if a patient is on recurrent episodes of treatment with antibiotics and clindamycin, for example, someone who is treated with antibiotics, that is something which can lead to weight gain. And exposure, chronic exposure to antibiotics, I'm not talking about typical antibiotics, but general antibiotics, if the patient is on a fever or on the exposure for that period of six months, that contributes to weight gain. But this is the role of diet. You can see here the high fat five diet, the vegetarian diet, and the calorie restricted diet. Each of them have got their own independent effects on uh, the microbial flora of the gut. For example, if you're having a high fat diet that is decreased in the general in the class of Australia, bacteria is also in large intestine, it is decreased in the lactobacillus species. If you're on a vegetarian diet, there is decreased in asteroid species, bifidobacteria species, and sherry coli. If the calorie restricted, there is decreased in firmicutes and bacteria. Now, this is something which is very important. I'd like you to particularly focus your attention on these because these are the key players in the gut metabolic system. What about the role of probiotics? that breastfed babies have a higher level of bifidobacteria than what we have seen. And all of the babies that have a diverse microbiota with a higher level of bacteria is getting infected. So we know what probiotics and prebiotics are, but what has been seen is that probiotics, basically in, with the use of probiotics, lactobacillus, great rewritery, if given in patients with hypercholesterolemia, can significantly lower the risk of cancer. And there have been studies on this. For example, and with a prebiotic, for example, it can modify the composition of the gut. So 
wire they can target the distributed battery as well as the satellite. And what has been interesting is this is one of the important developments is that they're using free and providing together, they can counter the risk. And they have been studying this. Now, these are the weekly functions of the black mark providers which you're all familiar with. So basically, they have got effect on a four part is on the inflammation and the response. The other one is with the interference with the intestinal barrier integrity. The third one is the production of vitamins, which is which is also the B3 vitamins come from the both to the drug metabolism, which was the top of the So this is exactly where the role of the strong in fatty acids in the diet comes. Now, if this window, whenever we are taking a mixed meal, it contains carbohydrate, it contains fat. So, what happens in the gut, particularly in the large gut, if you eat part of that carbohydrate rich meal, there is a polysaccharide fermentation, and this produces a short chain fatty acid. Now, this majority of the short chain fatty acids are absorbed in the colon, but some is distributed through the stool. So, whatever happens in the colon when they absorb, it reaches the liver, the adipose tissue, and the kidneys after the uptake by the G protein coupled receptor. GPR as we call it. So you can see here these are the different types of the protein fatty acids and these are the different GPRs to which they're accepted. Now through these GPRs they, they initiate several procedures. One is the adipogenesis in the liver. So basically there's a conversion of this short chain fatty acids into a triglyceride. There's a suppression of cholesterol synthesis and there is an effect on the regulation of the density. I've also seen in the insulin companies have been seen, not only in animal models, but in also some human studies as well. What about obesity and gut microbiome? What exactly do we find? Now, this is something which is basically a transition from the experimental medicine to proper medicine. What they found out that metabolically obese mice, that is the altered leptin genes or the BD of gene genes, basically they have got a different specific gut microbiome to compare to the normal genes. And the basic difference is that there is a reduction in the bacteria and the bacterial ages and the increase in the pharmacy. So there is an alteration of this pharmacy with respect to the and this is something which has been shown to play an active role in the development of obesity. And this is something which has been replicated in obese individuals, but in obese women, because we all know women are different from men, that both those pharmaceuticals and bacteria is also to go up. Now, whether that actually translates into a lesser incidence of diabetes in women, we do not know. Now, also something which has been seen is that microbiota transplantation from genetically obese mice to lean mice provoke a very significant rainbow. And the reverse is also happening. So basically, if you do the other way around, it just reverses on its own. And more the production of the short chain fatty acids, there is again a receptor activation which will contribute to an increased nutrient uptake, leading to the nutrient uptake and deposition. So these people, which have been seen in mice also, which have been seen in human models, that these people from the same pool, they absorb more calories than uh, someone who doesn't have to. This is another very important issue of this biases in the pathogenesis of the So basically, gram-negative species, particularly E. coli and high fat diet, there is something known as a translocation of the lipopolysaccharide into the bloodstream of the species. Now what happens is that at the same time there is also reduction in the dithyroid production. So these things together that the lip increased lipopolysaccharide reduce future rate, it increases the intestinal permeability. Now this obviously which facilitates the absorption of this lipopolysaccharide into your bloodstream, it contributes to two factors. It leads to the increase in inflammation, the cellular inflammation, the tissue inflammation. It increases the insulin resistance and reduces the GLP-1. So this ultimately becomes a sort of a vicious cycle. So there's an increase in two risk even chronic inflammation is going on. There's a worsened microbial spectrum, further worsening the insulin resistance and the chronic inflammation and that's what the vicious cycle goes. Ultimately, there is also a disease. So, basically, this is what has been seen from the just a summary of what we have seen so far. In obese model, there is an increase in the pharmacogenesis of bacteria ratio. In a human study, they have found an increase in the enterobacteria, clostridium, shared G. coli, bacteroides, and the pathogen bacteria goes up. Uh, there has been also increase in the bacteroides of algates, and this is something which increases the life of the bacteria. In human studies, also seen that increase in the bacteroides leads to the mark increase in the inflammatory markers of the pathogenic IL-1 beta So these are the animal studies. A very busy slide. I'll not get into get you into this. Let us go on to what we call the human studies in type. It is very interesting to know that this gut microbiota has been shown to have an important role 
in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes. What is that? So basically type 1 diabetes patients are characterized by a decreased FB ratio. I'll just put it in that way because stomach due to the bacterial ratios. So there is, a, in obesity, there is an increased ratio. In type 1 diabetes, it is very decreased. And studies have also shown that HB1 is negatively correlated with the fecal bacterial level. Now, beneficial bacteria, and will be bacteria, for example, the Bifidobacterium genus goes down, and the Candida albicans and Enterobacteriaceae goes up type 1 diabetes. There's some very interesting study done in new newly diagnosed pediatric type 1 diabetes patients where they found out that children must be 2.9 years age. If they have got this sense of this oxygen plus the four and sixteen, yes, sorry, yes, I'm four and sixteen, then what happens to that? They're basically protected against the development of type one diabetes. Also, the important factor is that the bacterial diversity and stability over time in autonomic individuals goes down in patients with more diverse type of population. They tend to come up with some type um, But however, once the patient is born to develop a type 1 diabetes, after that, the autonomic profile and the microbiome is not This is another study on humans in type 2. Again, here, unfortunately, we have got lesser data on type 2 diabetes. But modification of blood microbiota by probiotics and prebiotics appears to promote good health. Yes, prebiotics and probiotics are going to definitely go to prevention of people with type 2 diabetes. Uh, Lactobacillus has been shown to have positive association with type 2 diabetes. And basically, it leads to an increase in cell sensitivity to the muscle and reduces the flow in front of the cytokines. And there is this interesting study which shows that administration of, can somebody please have a look at it here, administration of symbiotic shapes containing the bifidobacterium bifidum, the lactobacillus acidophilus, in patients with type 2 diabetes, it decreased the fasting plus of glucose. So, this is in addition to, uh, in addition to people. Without any sort of pharmacopoeia. Uh, and alterations of blood microbiota towards that of the healthy control had a positive effect on the micro and macrovascular complications, particularly that relation that this has this particular difficulty has been seen in relation to type and diabetes. Two two microvascular complications. One is the diabetic retinopathy, and the other one is the diabetic body. So there is a direct correlation with this. Altered microbiome. Shall we take this time as a time out? Yeah. This is something which is known as uh, oft repeated a cliche for technological age. Right, anyway. So, basically, what about the role of the anti diabetic drugs? Now, what we all know that at least 66% of the oral drugs were metabolized by at least one strain of bacteria. And this is something which has been seen that Boglebo's administration reduces this pharmaceutical bacterial ratio and it brings about significant changes in the level. Acarbose in pre diabetics has been shown to increase the lactobacillus. It has been shown to reduce the dialysis and nutria fuscus, bacterium, and the lumino fuscus. And GLP one along CPC for individuals in five liters of have shown a reduction. Remember, in adult type of diabetes, the lower this ratio, the better it is. SGLT inhibitors have been shown to have a reducing effect on the pharmacutes, bacterials, but only in mice or in humans. This brings us to one important drug about which I've spoken so far that is about the metabolic. Now, there has been some, this is the only one drug on which there has been some RCT studies. So what has been seen is that metformin changes around 80 strains of blood microbes and most of the changes again occurred in the pharmacutes and the proteobacteria phyla to the SCFAs to the bacteria and the SCFAs to the G protein coupling receptors of GFDR and 41 form of three lead to the production of the GLP1 and PY1. So metformin indirectly has got a part to effect in the GLP1 production and the PY1. So basically it also reduces the inflammatory markers and metformin enhances the abundance of this particular slide will explain exactly what happens. So we've got metformin here. It has got an effect on the acetic acid, acetic producing bacteria, and the net result.
Now, what are the problems? Basically, most of the studies, there are very small studies. I will just try to highlight what are the problems. There are problems related to the studies of population, small sample sizes, studies related problems related to the duration of intervention. There's only one study with a one year duration of intervention. There are methodological methods, not the same methodology was followed in the two studies. And uh, they did not look at all the same kind of the markers. There are other issues like the result of nature, lack of information on macronutrients. Direction for future studies. So, what we have suggested is that we need larger sample sizes, we need, need longer intervention trials, given the use of standard analytical approaches and combinations of different techniques, and adjustment of prevention co founders, and characterization of methods and products, exactly what is going wrong. These things have to be highlighted. And I'd really be grateful if RSSDA research team can take up a similar project because this is something which is going to the face of diabetes in the next 10 to 15 years. So the final take home message is that gut microbiota has got an important role to play in the media process. Increases the pharmacopoeia bacterial risk ratio, obesity and very close to diabetes. Insulin resistance and chronic inflammation worsens the dysbiosis, leading to a worsened microbial spectrum, leading to a vicious and close to worsening. So combining prebiotics and probiotics can counter obesity. And despite significant animal risk, there is inadequate data in humans, so we need to have more data before we can get it. Treatment algorithm. And the larger prospective studies with bigger purposes. With that, I may present a historical overview of the